And I said I would never, ever be like that. Uh, and like I said, at the age of 11, I, I started this path with, you know, messing around with food. And I didn't like who I was. And at the age of 14, I went on a humanitarian aid trip to the Ukraine, to Chernobyl, with a lorry load of medicine and a load of volunteers from Bristol University and different things. And I remember at that age of 14, and it broke me just then thinking about it, that I was there and nobody really knew that I was, had this eating disorder going on. And everybody was so hospitable over there. The people over there are just beautiful people. I remember them providing like bacon that would cost them the world. I, I used to see people walking around with watermelons, holding them up in the air. And I was like, what's that about? But that was a, a status symbol of wealth over there. This poor country, but they gave us everything. And I remember at that age of 14, being spoilt, rotten by the food that they were providing. And I was eating it and then going and being sick behind closed doors. And that's, it was a memory that I needed to be reminded of because addiction manifests in so many different ways. And so many people say to me, you don't look like somebody that could possibly drink two liters of vodka a day and want to die, but that's my story. That's where it took me over the years from that age of 11 up to the age of 28 when I found recovery. And it, it can happen to any one of us. And that's the thing, and I had such a heart to help break down the fear and stigma and the walls of how people perceive addiction, destructive behaviors and compulsive habits because they all roll into one. And I've done a lot of research about this because I work in it now, but they say that 80 to 90% of people have a habit, destructive behavior, or as full-blown as an addiction that if they were free of, they would be happier. So this is a massive issue that we contend with and it's just a privilege to be here today to actually share a bit of my story around it, say what actually is happening and how I believe that we are at a poignant time in history where the church can step in and do something different. We can change the culture of this. We have the largest volunteer network in the whole world. If everybody just knew a little bit more of what to do, the impact could be phenomenal. And when it comes to addiction, you know, often we jump to kind of drink and drugs, but it's not just drink and drugs. You know, there, there's food, there, there is entertainment, uh, there's gambling, there's so many different ways. I mean, I've battled with in my life work, being a bit of a workaholic. Anyone else relate to that? I, I, know, I know there's others in the room that can relate to that. Um, so, you know, sugar is another big one, isn't it? They say sugar is, is highly addictive. And so this is something that, you know, touches so many lives. And even if you're here today or you're watching online, you say, oh, I don't struggle with any addictions, you will know people that do. Uh, there will be people. Emma, a lot of what you do as well is reaching out to people who are struggling with mental health. And obviously in this season through the COVID that we've been through, I mean, mental health is one of the major um, subjects that's talked about. A lot of people are being more open. It's not, I don't think it's that, that those problems weren't there. But I think it's now people are being more courageous and brave in coming forward and saying, hey, I actually have some struggles in this area. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, STAR and what does STAR stand for? and tell us a little bit about um, what this organization does. Certainly, um, firstly, you said about people becoming more courageous and brave to address these issues. I think there's definitely that, but there's also the fact that we can't hide them anymore. If you think of the pandemic over the last couple of years, we've been through so many different spectrums where, where different behaviors have come to light in different ways. I know for me, when there were the food sh like shortages, I've been free of food addiction for over, gosh, probably about 20 years now. But it started, I could get that panicky feeling because of, are we going to go without? Are we going to have to control? Uh, you look at people going towards things like online shopping. My post lady became one of my best friends through COVID. You know, I saw her almost every day. And I had to have a little check in with myself. I've got a bit of an issue going on here. Um, you know, and gambling just so easily, pornography, but then think of things like social media. 
and the way that the news was feeding us. It, you know, I remember getting the pings on my phone and it would give me almost like that dopamine hit of like, oh yes, you know, we are programmed to be addicted. There's a, there's a re really good quote from John Mark Comer, which may be on a slide. Um, and it basically says that in that, that, you know, children, the way that they actually, it says here, the fact that we have access to the kind of technology that allows us and our young people to talk face to face with friends across the world and access all kinds of information is beautiful. But this doesn't take away from the fact that the phone has been designed not as a tool, but as an instrument to steal our attention and addict us to it. The, the makers of Facebook, they actually say that Facebook was created to be addictive. That's why we have the likes in it. Uh, and and we, we've developed a culture that is all around instant gratification, likes, getting that dopamine fix. Um, so we are in that, and especially for those young people. So I've worked within um, sort of addiction ministries um, for probably about eight years now. It's funny because I, when I went to rehab uh, back 15 years ago, um, and you're, I've got a picture actually, just to show you what addiction um, actually did to me. This was me 15 years ago, and, and uh, you know, it's not the greatest picture, but I need to be reminded of where it took me. I was drinking two liters of vodka a day, just wanting to give up and die, and I didn't see any hope. I'd been brought up in a Christian home, but I was so distant from God, but he carried me so much through that time. And I remember going into that rehab and, and literally they talked about a higher power and I was like, I kind of know who that is. And that was the start of me re, you know, really reconnecting with God and getting to know Jesus. And um, you know, it's been a beautiful journey you know, for, for me in that sense. But like I said, I've worked in addiction ministries for about eight years. Um, and I haven't met an, a church or a community that doesn't want to help with people with addiction and compulsive behaviors, but they just don't know what to do. They honestly don't know what to do. And sometimes the well-wishing way of the church, and I'm being very bold and blunt because that's who I am, but can actually be counterproductive. And so I met a wonderful life group who had a lady that was struggling with alcoholism in her group. And it was quite an affluent group and they decided, and it was a lovely gesture, but they went and bought her a car because they thought that would get her to meetings, to appointments, to really start her recovery journey. She couldn't leave her house without drinking neat vodka, so you give somebody the keys to a car. You know, and it's just little things like that, that actually, if, if people were educated a bit more, they could maybe have done something different. And actually, I, like I said, I've worked, I've, I've run recovery courses nationally. And like I said, I was one of the very few people in that rehab where you saw that picture taken. I said I would never, ever, ever work in addiction. And I love God's sense of humor <laughs> because that's all I kind of do now. Uh, and, and 15 years ago, I couldn't even be in a room with more than two people out of anxiety. I was this shell. And if you'd have asked me to public speak, you, I would have been absolutely not. At university I did, but I'd get stoned before I did it, just out because of trying to take away the fear. And, you know, so now to do what I do today, and, and you know, I've done TV work and different things, and, you know, meeting J. John next week and doing some stuff with him, and it's just phenomenal. And it, it blows my mind, and that's where, you know, I know that with, there's a verse I love in Matthew, you know, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And like I said earlier about, um, I believe we can change a culture around addiction. So having worked within churches for eight years, running recovery courses, all this stuff, I saw that there was a need to really kind of almost backtrack, help volunteer teams and church communities to have a little bit more awareness of this stuff. Break down those walls of fear and stigma that we talked about. Come alongside a church community and say, hey, you don't need to do all this on your own. We know that leadership teams are absolutely flat out exhausted. Why don't we take away some of that pressure, come alongside you, give you some of the tools, the resources, equip you, train you to a place where you can actually do the stuff. So we set up this charity. It's funny, about three years ago, I just literally brain dumped all my frustrations, you know. And I think God honored that, and he put the right people in, in our path, and we formed a charity called STAR. Um, which stands for Steps to Active Recovery. It was going to be addiction recovery, 
but we think active recovery, because it's all about getting to a place of doing something and making an impact. And actually, this could be a charity that ends up working in homelessness, mental health specifically. At the moment, we're focusing on the addiction side. So it's basically bringing a standardization into churches so that you know if you walked into a star-approved church that it meets this level of criteria that you know that that team is confident, equipped, they're working in collaboration with their community. Um, and this kind of, I remember going and speaking in Pentonville Prison um, before, just before I sort of did this big brain dump. And I met this lovely guy who had come to faith in prison and he was on an addiction, you know, recovery journey. And he was coming out of prison two weeks later and I got to pray with him and we were talking and, and he, he said, I just don't know where to go though when I leave. You know, they've got the resettlement help in prisons, but not necessarily connecting with churches that just get this stuff. I said, well, how are you going to find somewhere? And he said, well, I'll just search until I find somewhere and hope I find somewhere. And, and that broke me because it's in the searching people get lost. That's, you know, where people fall off the rails. They go back, they relapse, they lose their accommodation. So imagine if he could have left there and known if he was coming to Portsmouth, for example, he's walking into City Life Church and he knows that's a star-approved community. They get this stuff. You know, that is my heart, that we have these communities all over the country. We've been testing it for the last two and a half years. And it is actually about to launch fully this year. So that's kind of where we're at on the journey of star. And the star led people to Jesus. So ultimately, we want people to find Jesus along the way. That's amazing. Now, I know that um, when you were doing your preparations to come here, you looked a little bit into our city and yeah. Portsmouth and some perhaps surprising, shocking statistics. And when we were talking on the sofa um, in the lower level beforehand, you're like, well, oh, should I share this? And, you know, I felt it was really important that we, we need to face facts and, and not shy away from stuff. And I think as, as a church... When people are struggling, often there's layers of shame and guilt and embarrassment where we're like, oh, like, I can't tell anyone because I'll be rejected, I'll be shunned, I'll be, you know, pushed out of the community. But I want to just say right right now, you know, as your pastor, um, you will never be rejected. You have a problem, you have struggles. Because the reality is, we all have struggles. And they might look different. But we all have things that we battle with, that we're working through. And so we need to have the courage to be real, to be honest, to be open, that it's okay. Guys, if we can't talk about this in church, I mean, you're going to be sharing it in some other circles that perhaps you're not going to be getting the best advice and feedback from. And so we need to, you know, authenticity, I think, is something that we as Christians that we need to hold on to. As humanity, we need to hold on. Let's be real, let's be honest. So let's hear some of these stats, Emma. Yeah, the, um, this is taken from a few years ago. There's not that much really current stats, so things probably have increased during the, you know, the last couple of years. But Portsmouth suffers more alcohol-related harm than the England average across a range of measures, including alcohol-related deaths. And it says with that that a few years ago, this city had 87 deaths due to substance misuse over a two-year period at a rate of 14.9% per 100,000 people. The national average at that time was only 6.7%, so it was double here. Uh, for me, that's shocking. Um, and then the other one was that Portsmouth has a higher rate of opiate and crack cocaine users than the national estimated average and one of the highest rates of drug-related deaths in England. And admittedly, this was from a couple of years ago, but it's still a very shocking group of statistics in that. I mean, there's a lot of statistics out there about people gravitating to south coastal areas as well, thinking the grass is greener. Um, but the reality is you just take your issues with you. Um, you know, I remember in rehab, everyone said, don't move to Bournemouth, it's full of drug addicts and alcoholics. So I'm like, well, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of recovery then too, you know. So that's what took me to, to Bournemouth. And, and it's a bit like, you know, um, there's an area in Bournemouth that everyone says, don't live in that area. Well, if you don't get good people move there, then how will it ever change? And, and, and we can just accept things or we can actually do something about it. I know there's a verse that 
you were sharing um, earlier on and when we were chatting from Isaiah. Do you want to share that with the people? Because I know that's very much a heartbeat of what you're trying to do through this organization staff. Yeah, so Isaiah 61 was a verse that kept, you know, prophetically being sort of part of my direction when we were looking at starting this charity. And I don't, the only bit I would say is I believe it's us, not I in this, you know, in, you know, so I believe that the spirit of the Lord is on us, you know, because he's anointed us as a church to proclaim good news to the poor. And he sent us to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And actually, I really, that always moves me when I, you know, for, for me, addiction, destructive behaviors and habits, that's what makes us captive of something. Because I know for me, when I was in active addiction, it just took such a hold. I couldn't see anything else. You know, I knew I was a good person. All my morals went out the window. You know, put a drink inside me, and I do things that I would never normally do. I end up on probation. I've smashed up my car drink driving. I could have killed somebody. I've hurt people. I've, I've ruined so many people's lives in the past. But God's forgiven me for that, you know. Um, and the bit about also, you know, the, the prisoners, we can often think of just people in an actual prison, in those four walls of a prison. But for me, my prison was a beautiful flat and a lovely sofa. That was my prison, and it still had the same pain. And, and Daniel touched earlier about, about the differences of addictions and habits and destructive behaviors because I want to challenge our perception today because like we said that 80 to 90 percent of people sitting in here today could have something going on that they need some support with and the first thing is about getting real about that and opening up and actually saying yeah I have a problem and I need help um, and I remember when I went to see the recovery course running in a HDB church in London about eight years ago and I, I got put into this little women's group um, and they said you know just listen join in if you want and it was a lovely little group of ladies, and they, they, for identification purposes, they all sort of said what each person's struggles were. Um, and there was all probably about eight ladies about my age, and one little old lady who, I'll be honest, she looked like my former grandmother, you know. And I thought she must be there supporting somebody um, that was in the group. And we went around the group, and the, all the women were like saying that they had addictions to crack cocaine, alcohol. Uh, and then it got to this little woman, and I thought she's going to pass, you know. And she didn't. And she looked at me and she said, Emma, I've got a habit that's ruining my life. And I was like, really? Uh, and this is the thing. I could be judgmental, and I still can be today. That's why I have to keep a check of things. And anyway, this little old lady, she just sort of looked me in the face, and she just went, Emma, I, you know, it's the first thing I do in the morning and the last thing I do at night. I spend all my money on it. I've been married to my husband for 50 years and he's thinking of divorcing me because of it and my kids don't speak to me anymore. And I was like, by this point, I was out of my seat, like, what is it, what is it? And she was like, I'm addicted to cross stitch. And I was like, you what? And I laughed at her. I was like, cross stitch, that's like knitting sort of stuff that my nan used to do. And, and then I looked at her and the pain in her face I'm not joking. It was just, gosh, that really moved me then saying that because I saw this pain in that woman's eyes that was exactly, if not worse, to be honest, than the pain that I went through drinking two litres of vodka a day and just wanting to die. The fact for me was that alcohol numbed it a bit. She couldn't numb that. And she was just broken. She didn't know what to do with her life anymore. It had ruined her life. I met another guy once that um, brought his wife newlywed wife, they're a Christian couple, brought her to a recovery course. And he just said, can I sit at the back while she accesses the course because she had an issue with alcohol? I said, yeah, of course, that's no problem. We're, we're all about supporting families and people because we've got a program for them as well, um, which I'll explain. But um, he just sat and after a couple of weeks, he was like, do you mind if I sit in the men's group? And I was like, well, you do have to kind of qualify. You know, what, what's, what's your... I'm a bit bold. I was like, what's your issue? And, um, and he was like, well, I realize that I have an issue that is really controlling my life. And he, he started telling me a story. He went on hot honeymoon with his wife, meant to be one of the most beautiful times away. 
And he said that all he could think about was where could he go and bite his nails. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah, I, I, my wife knows that I have a bit of a nibble on my nails, but she didn't realize how much the obsession in his head, he couldn't do it around people. He had to literally physically take himself away because the obsession in his mind was so powerful. And it's, he said, I couldn't be present for my wife on her honeymoon because of that. You know, so it's just to challenge your perception of what is it in our lives that's taking us away from being present. And that's an issue that we can address. So lots of different forms that addictions, habits, obsessions can take um, that can be destructive in our lives. It's really inspiring having you here sharing your story because obviously you, you know, battled with eating disorder, with very hard drink uh, as well and how there was a lot of anxiety that was going on and some you know things in your past as well and here you are today your mess has become a message and so i really want to encourage uh, those of you that are here today uh, and 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 watching through church online to know that whatever struggles that you might have been through in your life this is the good news of how god works that he can recycle your ashes and he can create something beautiful out of it um, we did a series on Nehemiah um, a few years ago and one of the lines that we looked at in that was about how that Nehemiah's misery became his ministry so sometimes those things that upset us sometimes those things that get us down when we keep it to ourselves yeah it's worthless it's, it's, it's wasted but this is the amazing thing when we put it in the hands of God he can create something really beautiful. It's like the, it becomes the fertilizer to grow something beautiful. So I just really want to, those of you that may be here, and, you know, maybe even you're still going through some stuff, I pray that God will begin to give you vision to see you know, that it's not a prison that you have to stay in, that there is a way out, that freedom is available through Jesus Christ. He, he can do the impossible in your life. And actually you can bring a real message of hope that can change uh, many lives. Um, Emma, do you want to share just a little bit about maybe those who are here and, and maybe in the thick of kind of some kind of addiction, maybe something we've mentioned, maybe something we've not mentioned, what would you be um, saying to those people right now? The hardest step is actually to uh, sort of actually bring it to ourselves that we have this that's going on. And I hope today that it may have stirred some spirits of maybe a bit of disease around something, in all honesty. But then if there is something that you know in your mind that is not quite right, I would really suggest that you talk to somebody that you trust about this. Like Daniel said, you're not going to be judged. You know, we all we all fall short. And that's the, that's the thing. And in talking to somebody, that will help because it's a problem that is not then just yourself. You know, the, the disease of addiction wants to isolate us. That is one of the biggest offenders of addiction. Not necessarily the substance, the habit. It's actually the pain that we're going through that we can't necessarily share. And, and the actual habit or substance is the, the, the sort of follow-on from whatever's going on. So unless we actually look at what is causing that deep-rooted pain that's causing us to reach out to something that's not good for us, that is the issue. Um, and we all go through pain. 100% of people on the planet go through pain. So to talk about your pain with someone, if that is a bit more palatable than saying, I'm going to just <laughs> divulge I've got an addiction. And in doing so, you'll be able to actually open up about what that pain then looks like. Um, and then we do have support. We have, um, through STAR, you can go onto the website. It's starrecovery.org. But you can actually, we run two online courses a year. So if people want to do online we call them life courses as well, because I think there's power in not labeling everything as addiction. You know, I rarely would say that I'm an alcoholic today unless I'm in an AA meeting just for identification for the other people. You know, I've had alcohol struggles, but I am not defined for the rest of my life by being an alcoholic. And, and so we created what we call the Star Life Course because it's about helping people to understand what's going on in their life that is causing them to do things that are destructive. And in that, we look at the mind, body, and spirit. So it draws in 
the sort of biblical element, loosely the 12 step analogies of them, and you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, but we look at the mind and how the mind works. So that actually, there is a, the next online course starts on Tuesday. Um, and if you go to the website, you can just sign up. You can do it anonymously if you want. Um, and it's a 12 week course every evening on a Tuesday for 12 weeks. And you can just be with people that get this stuff. The other thing, hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll help this community to become a star accrued community. We just need some people that have a passion for this to get involved. Um, and we can go on that journey with you. So there's more actively going on here. Um, there are some great other things around, depending on what the struggle is. There's 12-step fellowships around in the area, I know that. Um, and there's de different access. So by speaking to someone and asking them to help you to find places, um, we can get you the help that you need. And I always say this, and I'll, it's a, do you mind me sharing a little story about my mum? I believe that we only need to know a little bit of something in order to change someone's life. And, and I, one of the blessings, obviously I haven't touched much on my addiction story, um, but you know, it was flipping messy. It was horrible, I hated my life. I didn't, I didn't wanna live anymore. But actually in God's grace, he's done so much in my life that I now get to share more about the things he's doing now. Um, and I was six weeks sober and I got the opportunity to be present and do CPR on my mum. And she's alive to tell the tale. Had I been drinking, there is no way that I would have been able to do that. And you know, God's timing is so perfect. Um, and I, this is me and my mum, and she is a you know, phenomenal woman, but basically what happened was I decided I would make amends to her, because she'd always wanted to go to Iceland and I, Iceland, the country, not the shop, because one day I said, I said this talk, right? I was talking about this, and someone came up to me at the end and said, that's a really cheap amends, taking your mum to a frozen food store. <laughs> but anyway, I'd taken my mum to Iceland. We didn't even see the Northern Lights, but it was beautiful. And, and we literally got back into my flat in Bournemouth, and she got up in the morning, and she was about to drive back to Wales. And, and we've always been, like, best friends. She supported me through thick and thin, you know. And um, she got up in the morning, and she, we were just talking, and then next thing, she's on the floor, she's fallen. And I thought she just tripped over, but she'd had a sudden cardiac arrest in front of me. And in that moment, I, um, I basically, I just didn't know what to do, but I, this is where he puts people in your path. There was another girl in that block who was um, also in recovery, very early days, and she'd just done her CPR training. So the two of us got to work on my mum. It took eight and a half minutes, and that's back in the day. It takes probably about eight hours at the moment for an ambulance to come, bless them, you know. But in that time, eight and a half minutes seemed like a lifetime. And, and in that eight and a half minutes, it was she was doing CPR to um, Nelly the Elephant, the song, and I was doing it to, I don't know if you remember the Vinnie Jones campaign, Staying Alive. I was doing it to Staying Alive. So it was kind of comical in the, one of the worst moments of my life. And, and it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. But, but in that, when the paramedics came and they took over, all I could do was step back. And we talk about in, in recovery about being powerless, like powerless. And that for me was the epitome of powerlessness for me. And I had to stand back and I started praying. And I was praying and praying. And I was saying the serenity prayer, which we use in 12-step fellowships. You know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference and I was just saying it and saying it and this peace just fell in that room even though there was just the most chaotic stuff going on and there's shock in my mum's heart and there's no response and they shocked her heart six or seven times and then the paramedic with the paddles turned around and looked at me and he said you know I'm so sorry and they were going to stop and there was this this peace that had fallen and I looked at the paramedic and I it wasn't me, no way could I have got the words out, but he, I just looked at him and said, please can you try one more time? And he turned around and he shot mum's heart and, and she started coming to life. And you know, it was touch and go, but you know the beautiful thing about recovery for me was I was able to be a daughter in, in the hour that she, you know, the minute that she needed me. And I know that was the first time I actually visibly saw Jesus in a room. Um, he was there. And, and, you know, he's brought my mum back, and she's written this support group, and we call it the Star Life Support Program, and that's to help people affected by addiction. 
because often the family, the friends, the colleagues, they're the people that are also really forgotten. Um, and she's alive to tell the tale. She struggles still with health stuff, but I was able to be a daughter. And the very first words she said when she came through the couple of days that she was in intensive care, and she just looked at me and she just said, you know, Em, I'm powerless. And we just got it in that moment, you know. And that's all it takes sometimes. And the reason I say that is because we only knew a tiny little bit of CPR, but it was enough to save her life. And I believe that is exactly the same with what we contend with when it comes to addiction and destructive habits. We only need to know a tiny little bit, and it can have the biggest impact on someone's life. I remember back in the day, people just smiling at me would mean so much where I despised myself. You know, and having that culture where we embrace the pain, we embrace people that are struggling, that is what the, you know church should be about. And I'm going to do every single thing I can to make that happen around this country. Wow. So there's a big need in the city. And I would love for us as a church to do something about that. And I want to appeal to you to pray about it and, and ask God, is this something that you want me to get involved in? And there may be people here, there, there might be people that are tuning in today, there might even be people that are not here that are going to hear about this later on. But I would love for us as a church community to be able to do something to help those that are struggling. And so if that is you, if you kind of feel in that, yeah, this, I need to be part of this, then I want to encourage you, get in touch with Emma or come and chat with, you know, myself, Laura, Wynell, Paul. We would love to hear from you. and We would love to be able to start something up to work in partnership with STAR as a church so that we can begin to help those that are struggling in our city and region. And the great thing as well about STAR is that because some of the courses they're doing online, in a sense, it can access people even if they're not in the city. Um, so that's really great. Emma, thank you so much for being with us today. Why don't we show our appreciation to Emma? And why don't we also say thank you to the University of Portsmouth Gospel Choir as well. We want to invite you back. We are back. Don't forget, Friday and Saturday we have Gateway. and There will be an opportunity to sign up in the foyer if you want to do that or be on one of the teams. We'd love to have you here. We're also going to be here next Sunday, and I think we have a special guest on Sunday as well, but I'm not going to tell you who it is, So, um, but we are in for a treat. Um, someone who won't be at Gateway, but they will be there on the Sunday. So uh, do come along um, to that. And why not think about someone you could invite along as well? And um, let's be people that unleash that power of the invite and see lives transformed. Well, we're going to close there, but we've got tea and coffee and refreshments at the back. Um, do feel free to stick around, hang out. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. There will be a few of us down the front. If you want a prayer, if you want to chat with Emma, um, she'll be down the front as well. Emma, do you want to close us in prayer? I'd love to. Thank you. Before I turn the mic off. Um, Jesus, thank you that you've been here today. We just feel your presence. And I pray for those that have that connection going on in their spirit, that they know that there is something bubbling away that needs some work on. And we just give that pain to you today, Lord, and give people courage to be able to face that and speak to people and open up about what's going on for them. And I just thank you for this church and the community and it's heart to just love the least, the last, and the lost in this area. And we pray for more of that. We fan into flame what you're already doing and ask for more of that in this community. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Lots of love. Have a great day. <laughs>